we have been talking about the liberating secret of Christ. We've talked about the liberating secret of the cross and uh, his name. We're going to be talking about his glory. His glory. And I'll tell you, I got, uh, you'd be surprised how many times when you read the scriptures, common stuff, but then the Lord shows you something, and you realize you've been putting yourself there again. Remember, the volume of the book is written of him, not of me. Now, I want you to keep in mind, he had all this with us in view. But, it's all about Jesus. I mean, it's, it's really all about Jesus. And I'm going I'm to show you... I'm going to show you some things today, and I'm going to tell you what, we're going to, these next couple of weeks, because I'll never get all of it done today, because i got a lot of scriptures to read today, are some things that, that I've been seeing, and now the next couple of weeks we're going to, we're going to be talking about what, what glory really is. I got, I grew up hearing that this one scripture quoted all the time. Father, glorify me with the same glory as I had with thee before the world was. And boy, we'd quote that scripture and go on. But here's the question. What is glory? I mean, do you ever really? I mean, we've been talking for <laughs> since February about faith on Wednesday night. Since February. February, March, April, May, now June. Five months not covered the same thing twice on faith. It's more than what you can just put up here on the board in number one, two, three. Here's faith. One, two, three, and you got it. Glory. I'm telling you what, glory. That, but we're going to see. Well, like I said, we're going to let scriptures declare. See, here's what, here's what we do. We write, we write, uh, just picture this in your mind, righteousness and holiness and glory and, and sanctification and draw a line and point to Jesus and say, righteousness describes Jesus. That's wrong. Put a big line at Jesus and draw a line towards righteousness and say, he gives righteousness definition. He gives holiness definition. It don't describe him. He describes it. Do you, do you see the difference? We got our arrows going in the wrong way. I'm glad the Lord is, is changing things around with us. I, I just say it. And I, I just hope and pray, you know, the Spirit of the, of the Lord will, will show us what glory is all about. We're, we're going to see some things. Because I'm going to tell you what, most believers don't have a clue what glory is about. They don't have a clue. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't need it. I mean, I, I'm just telling you the truth. We can go through a whole lot of things and we can quote a whole lot of scriptures, but do we really know what glory is. Maybe in our child's mind we think glory is a shiny coin. That coin shines more than other. It's got glory. But I'm going to tell you what, when you when 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 we get to the bottom of this, my gosh. It'll it'll gonna change some things. I, I will tell you. And there's a liberating secret in it. Because what we're gonna see here, we're just we're not going to see a believer, but believers. Not just a member, but members. And I'll tell you something else we're going to, that we got to understand. We're going to go through, because you can read it right in Romans. Uh, let me just, let me just flip over there. Because we're going to, we're going to discuss this in a way that maybe you've heard it before, but I had never had now, I'm not going to diagram this scripture, but I'm just going to, in Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to, in this study, 
we're going to find out what it means to, to be predestinated. Because my God, how many churches are split over that? Predestinated. Well, I'm, see, if some was predestinated to be in, some would be predestinated to be out. But who is the center of all that? Still me. I got to get me out of the predestination and get the right one involved. Do you see what I mean? And this calling, I mean, this calling, who, I mean, who, who are the call? Listen, the call is went out, it's to whomsoever will. I mean, I mean, that's, that's the who the call goes out, to whosoever will, let him come. The king made a feast in one of the parables. He said, yeah, those who invited him, come go out by the highways and the byways and bite them all, tell them to come in. Whom he did foreknow, them he did also predestinate. What? We got calling in here. We got justified and also glorified. We got we to go through and discuss all them terms. But that's not where we're going right now. Because we got to go back over here and, and, and look at something. I'm going to be in Luke 18 that we'll start with. 18, Luke 18, 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. I want you to understand. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. Everything that's ever been said about me is going to be accomplished. My God, I, when I read that verse last night, I just, I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. I wonder if he got it done. You reckon he, when he said he finished it, he meant all the things that concern, the prophets concerning the man shall be uh, accomplished. Listen, verse 32, for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, and spitted on. They shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Now here is me and you. And they understood none of these things. Are you looking at me in verse 34? <laughs> they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. They understood none of the things because it was hid. It was hid. Now, keep that in mind. I just, I just want to lay a little bit. I want you to keep that in mind right there. He's got to go up to Jerusalem. All things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. It's going to be delivered to the Gentiles. Mark, treatfully, and, and, and spitefully entreated, spit it on, scourging, put to death, third day arise. They understood nothing. Now, look at uh, chapter 19, verse 1. And... What does and mean? We still got a continuation. Look at verse 34. And. Verse 35. And. Verse 36. And. Verse 37. And. Verse 38. And. Verse 39. And. Verse 40. And. Verse 42. And. Verse 43. And. Verse chapter 19, verse 1. And. Y'all know what and means. See, we want to stop and pull on something. This, this is and. I mean, it's still going on. He's, so he's headed up to Jerusalem, and what happens? Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. My God, how many scriptures have been, how many sermons have been preached on this little man, Zacchaeus? <laughs> Old little Zacchaeus climbs up the tree to see Jesus. Y'all know the story. I ain't, I ain't going there. Look at verse 7, chapter 19, verse 7. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Verse 9, And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. 
For as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Well, did you hear what he just said right here? Today, salvation has come to your house for your son of Abraham. Now remember before he had called him, you're, uh, you're of your father the devil. But now Zacchaeus is the son of Abraham. Salvation has come to his house today. Now here's the part that jumped off the face of me. Chapter or, or verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save who was lost. Are y'all looking at the Bible? That ain't what it says, is it? For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I guarantee you, guys and myself included, we can run around and we can say, when well, Jesus said it, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And here's the question, what was lost? Me, brother. Me. I was lost. I was lost. You know what? The volume of the book is written of him. You see? I thought it was all about me. He come to seek and save that which was lost. Something was lost that's a whole lot more important than me. We got to go figure out what was lost. You see? The first revelation that I get, I mean, I start to think, man, Josh, it's me. I was lost. I was lost. I'm lost. Now, now I'm found. You know, and I'm going to write a song about it. I can just see Jesus saying, when are you going to quit being so self-centered? There was something that was lost here. And I come to seek and save that which was lost. He didn't say who was lost. That which was lost. So we got to figure out what was lost. Before we can go any farther with this verse right here, we got to figure out what was lost. Now let's go all the way back to Exodus. Like I said, I got a lot of scriptures I got to go through. I'm going to Exodus 16, 32. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. Did you hear what he just said? I want you to fill an omer. Look, look at it. I want you to fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations. Why? So they may see the bread. My God, how many times on Wednesday night have we been talking about how faith made perfect? Faith cometh by hearing, faith makes perfect in seeing. He says, I want you to keep some of this because I want them to see the bread. What did Jesus say? I am the bread. That came down from heaven. He said he's going up to Jerusalem to accomplish all things spoken by the prophets. Moses says, they're going to see this bread. They're going to see this bread. They're going to see this bread. I want you to keep it. Now see, they was looking at this natural bread, but look. And Moses said to Aaron, take a pot, put an overfull of manna therein, lay it out before the Lord to be kept for your generations. Verse 34, as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. So in other words, they went out and they got some of this man off the ground. They put this man in a golden pot and they put it in the ark. That's what they're doing. <coughs> Why? Because I want you to see the bread. See the bread. Now, while you're in Exodus, flip over to chapter 25. I told you I got a lot of scriptures. Verse 16. <clears throat> and thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Now I'm going to skip down to verse 21 and 22. <clears throat> thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee. These are very, very important. Where's he going to meet with thee? Look, look what he says. And there, where's he going to meet? Thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and the ark shalt thou put the testimony that I give thee. And there, where's there? The, the mercy seat above the ark. There is where I'm going to meet with you. There's where I'm going 
to meet with you. And there I will meet with you, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubs, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. He says, right here at the mercy seat, that's where I'm going to meet you. Right there. I've determined a spot. Do you understand what I'm telling you? He says, guys, I've determined a place that I'm going to meet with you and I'm going to commune with you. And right there, I'm not going to meet with you over yonder. You know, we'll, we'll set up a, a, a date somewhere. Well, I'll meet you at Walmart's. You know, I'll, I'll meet you up here at the store and pull over on the side of the road and I'll meet you right there. He says, I'm going to meet you always from now on at the ark of the testimony between the chairs above the mercy seat. I'm not going to meet with you outside. I'm not going to meet with you over at the big rock. I'm going to meet with you right here. You see, guys, you've got to bring this from right over here into the New Testament. Same thing is going on. He says, guys, I'm going to meet with you in Christ. I'm not going to meet with you anywhere else but in Christ, in Christ alone, in his mercy and his goodness. That's the only place I will be is in Christ. Do you, do you see that's the only place he's ever going to be. Now, can you go back and see some things that are predestinated? He predestinated all things in Christ. He said, there is where I'm going to be. But remember, we're still on a search for what was lost. Now, while we're in Exodus 26, let's just or go to 26.31. Thou shalt make a veil of blue. Purple, scarlet, fine twilled linen of cunning work with cherubim shall it be made. Thou shalt hang it upon the four pillars of Shedom, wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. Thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatchets that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide between, or divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. Thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. Do you see what's happening here? Bring this ark in, and there's something that's going to divide you from God. The veil. Not just any veil, a veil of cunning work, a veil of blue. Jesus said in Hebrews, the veil is his flesh. His flesh. The veil is his flesh. But this veil, the mercy seat, the cherubims, the skull and pot of manna that we started reading with, he said, guys... I want, I want them to see the bread. Remember, I want them to see the bread. Well, if there's a veil, how can you see the bread? You can't see the bread. Why do you think when Jesus said, I am the true bread that came down from heaven, they couldn't see the bread, could they? So what happened? They all left. He even asked the disciples, you going to leave me too? Where else could we go? You have the words of eternal life. They couldn't see the bread. Why? The veil. The veil. The veil. Now, Exodus 30. 22. Moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, 250 shekels, and of sweet, countless 250 shekels, casey of 500 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and the oil, and the oil olive of him. Thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be a holy anointing oil. Thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation wherewith the ark of the testimony and the table and the vessels and the candlestick and the vessels and the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels and the labyrinths 
in his feet, and thou shalt sanctify them. Now listen, and that they may be most holy. Have you got me? He said, so, so I want you to, here's how you're going to make this oil. He says, right, here's what I want you to do. And I want you to go into the tabernacle, and I want you to anoint every single thing in the tabernacle. And every, once you anoint it, this is most holy. This is most holy. Now look at the last part of this verse right here. Verse 29. And whatsoever touches them shall be holy. My God, do you see that? He didn't say if you touch it, you're going to make it unholy. He says this thing is so holy that whatever touches it will be holy. Do you think that little woman with the issue of blood knew that scripture right there? Because she realized the tabernacle wasn't up there on the city somewhere. The tabernacle was walking around. And she said, this tabernacle is anointed. It's most holy. And if I can but touch that, I'll be made holy too. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Because it's like I used to tell you up there in Baptist Valley, you better watch because you're not going to affect me, but you better not touch me because I'm going to infect you. Yeah. Why? Because Christ is in us. Yes. Yes. The hope of glory. Yes. And whatever we touch, what's that? Most holy. Mm. Do, you, do you see that? Now I'm going to tell you what. Who was the one that was anointed? I believe, I believe that little sister walked in there with some oil. And she poured it all over Jesus' head. And she poured it all over Jesus' feet. Oh, yeah. Took her hair and, went and dried his feet. And the disciples said, we could have took that money and done a whole lot of other things. Remember what we read? He's going up to Jerusalem. All things concerning him is going to be accomplished. He's going up there to die. What did Jesus say? She's anointed me unto my death. Oh, God, and it's most holy. It's most holy. This anointing was unto death. I believe when Jesus went down into the water to be baptized by John, the Holy Spirit descended out of heaven in the bodily shape of a dove. And what happened? Anointed him. And it abode on him. So in everything he did from that moment on, he walked in that anointing. And it was most holy. Now look at verse 36. And thou shalt beat some of it, and put it, and put of it before the testimony of the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. He's going to take some of this compound, guys, and beat it to a pulp. And it's going to be to you most holy. Do you see what he's talking about right here? Remember what he said? I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to be spit on, but it's going to be to you most holy. Most holy. My God, I mean, when, you, when I start reading them things, and I start seeing Christ in them, it, it just blows my mind. Now, I'm still in Exodus 31, verse 15. Six days may work be done. My gosh, here we go. But in the Sabbath is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath, not on the Sabbath, in the Sabbath. Do you get that, guys? In the Sabbath, not on the Sabbath. People want to go around and say, we don't work on Sunday. He, didn't, he ain't got nothing to do with that. Guys, he's talking in the Sabbath. In the Sabbath is Jesus Christ, the place of rest. You need to rest while he does the work. He works in the Sabbath. Throw the old out the window. This is in. In the Sabbath. But my God, just look at this, guys. Look, 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 look. Six days may work be done, but in the Sabbath is the Sabbath. Holy to the Lord, whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath, he shall surely be put to death, my God. Who done the work? Listen, who was surely put to death? Jesus said, I come to do the works of my Father. What happened? He was surely put to death. Yeah. Are y'all with me? Man, I love seeing Jesus in these things. We want to throw it ourselves and start, and we want to jump up, but I'm, he was surely put to death. He said, it's going to be accomplished, Patty. I'm going up, and I'm going to die. Oh, yeah. 
Verse 16, wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation. Notice what he says, to observe it. What does observe mean? To look. Behold him. Behold the Sabbath. I want you to observe it. I want you to see the Sabbath. I want you to see Jesus. We sing that song. I see you, Jesus. We could just as well sing the song, I see you, Sabbath. I want you to keep it. I want you to observe it. Throughout all your generations for a covenant, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony. Tables of stone written with the finger of God. I said, my God, why is there two tables of stone? Do you think God Almighty could have wrote it on one? Could he made a bigger rock? Why was there two tables of stone? I don't know. I was just wondering this last night. Why two tables of stone? Y'all ever wonder things? I mean, when you read something, you just wonder, why is there two tables of stone? I mean, look what he says right here. Two tables of stone... Uh, or it says two tables of testimony tables of soul written with the finger of God two tables of testimony I mean that's that's what in my point I said Lord why why did you put say two tables of testimony tables of stone I mean that sounds like you know I don't like the way that's worded well he didn't counsel me about how it was worded I can tell you that But you know, Jesus, when he came here, and we've talked about this before, two tables of testimony, right? He was not only the son of God, he was the son of man. Yeah. Two tables of testimony. He come declaring both. He was the son of God, and he was also the son of man. Yeah. Two tables of testimony. Tables of stone written how? Written with the finger of God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Written with the finger of God. Can you see this? And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Remember he said, guys, I want you to take some of this bread. I want you to keep it because I want them to see this bread. You're going to see this bread. The volume of the book, it's written of him. Now, now let's go to Psalm. Psalms. I told you I had a lot of scriptures. I'm going to try to hurry. Watch my time. <clears throat> Psalms 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through... <laughs> All the earth, the words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. The bridegroom, Jesus was known as the bridegroom. He said, my God, as long as the bridegroom is with you, I mean, he was talking about that bridegroom. He's the bridegroom. You see what he's talking about right here? We want to look up in the expanse, God. No, let's get this thing down here and be real. And rejoices that the strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. We just read about two tables of testimony a minute ago. Two tables of testimony. And what's he say right here? The testimony of the Lord is sure. Let's just go stay in Psalms. Go to Psalm 78. Verse 1, give ear, O my people, to my law, and climb your ears to the words of my mouth. 
I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Remember, he's going up, but they knew it not. Which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob. I pointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. What's he going to make known to them? The testimony. He said, I've established a testimony in Jacob. I gave this thing to Moses and you're supposed to make your children know it. That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. He said, guys, I'm going to create a testimony. I'm going to set this testimony amongst you. You declare it to the next generation. That generation declares it to the next. Why? So that they'll have hope in God. I wonder, I wonder how many really have hope in God today. And if they don't, there's a simple reason. No testimony, because he tells us right here. There's got to be a testimony. Why? So that they might have hope in God. I mean, we can jump around and quote the scriptures. Christ in you, the hope of glory all day long, but do you really believe it? I'm going to tell you a whole lot don't believe it. They believe in it for some glad day. And one of these glad days, they don't believe it today. They don't realize hope is, a, is an assurance. A guarantee of glory. They don't understand that. They're out there in these buildings today looking, uh, thanking everybody, get flew out of here. Wanting to get out of here. Why? No testimony, guys. No testimony. No testimony. Now, how was this testimony written? We read this testimony is written with the finger of God. We've read it. I've been bringing it, been bringing it right up through the testimony. Look at Psalms 122. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I wonder how many people got up this morning and was glad and said, let us go. Not very many. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Now, why are they glad? Let's keep on reading. They're glad because they're going somewhere. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact. Notice the word together. One. That's what together means, one. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, into the testimony of Israel to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. Do you understand? They would get up in the morning. And they would be glad because they were going up to the city of Jerusalem because the Ark of the Covenant was there. And they would go up and give praise and honor and glory to God just because the Ark was there. The testimony. But we just read over there in Psalm 78 that well, there's no testimony. The people forget. This generation may know, then they forget, then they forget. And then I just remember something that used to happen. I don't know. We're going up through something's happening up there. I don't know. Let's go see. Do you understand what we're talking about here? We're talking about the testimony. Now, go back with me to Samuel. Samuel chapter 4. Here we got Eli. He's a priest. His sons, Hophni and Phinehas. He's called the old man. Here, I mean, and here he is. Lights going out. Lights going out. Getting ready to go to battle. Hophni and Phinehas. Look at verse 5. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp. Guys, what is the ark of the covenant? It is none other than the testimony. It's the testimony. When the testimony 
came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so the earth rang again. <coughs> Do you see that? They're, they got a lot of things going on. They're going to war. They look out and they see somebody's got the ark and they began to shout so much that the earth shook. Why? Because this is the testimony. Now I'm going to tell you what, not many people get happy today because of the testimony. They get happy about going to the lake. They get happy about doing everything else, but they don't have to get happy about gathering out with the saints of God. Why? Because you don't get me excited enough. Because they don't realize what's going on. You want to see Jesus, you come right in this place. Yes, yes. And look around and look at his body right here. I want you to go make me feel good. Get me all excited. If that don't get you excited about coming to see many members, but one body of Jesus Christ, that, there's nothing I can do for you. I ain't going outside and looking up into, into, into that place, looking out to look right here. The gathering of his body. They begin to shout. Now look, look at verse 6. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of heaven? Or the camp of the Hebrews. Same thing. They understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. They said, by God, what is this great big noise? What is going on here? Look at verse 7. And the Philistines were afraid. And they said, God is come into the camp. My God, do you understand what he's saying? The Philistines are afraid. Why? Because God is come into his people. That's why they're going to call you a cult and everything else, because God has come into his people. And they're afraid of that. I like God when he's way over yonder. I don't have to fool with him. I just call on him when I need some. God's a great big soda fountain. I'll put in my two quarters worth of prayer, and God, I want you to bless me. Then I want you to leave me alone. I'll be back when I need something else from you. We've all been there, guys. I'm going to tell you what. We're lying if we say, if we say hey, we've been there. But when we started to see the bread, yes. when we started to see the bread, I'm going to tell you what. Things got changed. Things got changed. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Now, look at verse 11. The ark of God was taken. The Phineas were slain. My God, do you see what's happening here, guys? The testimony is gone. The ark is gone. Look at verse 12. And there ran a man of the church, I mean Benjamin. Do you see that? Benjamin is a code name in the Old Testament for church. I'm talking the real body of the Lord. There ran, a, 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 guys, I just got to throw this out there. Who was Joseph's only true brother? Benjamin. Now, who was the one bringing the news that the old man and his sons is gone? Who, who was the guy bringing the news? A guy of the tribe of Benjamin. I just got to throw this out there. Do you guys remember what tribe Paul was from? You think that's a coincidence? I don't think so. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army, came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes written with earth upon his head. When he came low, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the men came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And here they go again, verse 14. What meaneth the noise of this? What's going on here? We don't understand. I got, I got to hurry. Let me just flip over. Uh, verse 19. And his daughter-in-law, finest wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, 
that her father-in-law and her husband were dead. She bowed herself and travail for her pains come upon her. About the time of her death, the woman stood by her, said to her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered, Not. Neither did she regard it. Do you know? Listen, guys. She just gave birth to a son. She, I mean, can you imagine being in the labor room, women, you guys who gave birth before? She just gave, gave birth, and here the doctor said, you just gave birth, and she regarded it not. Why did she regard it not? Guys, I want to tell you what. Now, this, this may sound cold, but I got to tell you something. We all, we, we, we as a church, as the body of Christ, male or female, there is no male or female, but, but really we are the bride of Christ. And I want to tell you what, guys, every one of us has had a barren womb because you go read in scriptures, the real bride of Christ has had a barren womb until the time appointed of the Father. But you know what we do? We'll, we'll produce our own children. Oh, yeah, we'll have this smells like crazy. We'll produce our children. And I can just see this woman right here because now I look at some of the children I've produced, and you know what? Regard them not. We got our concern about one thing. What, what, what is her concern right here? <clears throat> she named the child Ichabod, saying the glory is departed from Israel. Because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband, she said the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. Can't you see what she says? She says, guys, the testimony is gone. The testimony is gone. Now, now listen, we know as, as reading the scriptures that David brought the ark back. We know Solomon built a tabernacle, put in, put in the ark, pulled out the staves, and when the glory filled the temple, the priests couldn't go in there and minister. There was nothing in there but the glory. But did it stay there, guys? I, I'm going to flip over. Uh, well, I'm going I'm to go to Ezekiel. Chapter uh, 10, verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. Watch, guys, what you'll find if you go trace this out, you'll see that the glory that was over that place where he said he would meet him lifted up. And the wheels lifted up. And the chariots lifted up. And they went out. They stood over the temple. But then they went out. They stood over the city. But then they went out. They stood over the mountain. And they were gone, guys. The glory of God left that place. You go read in Daniel. You'll see in Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar came in, the first thing they did was go into the temple and they took everything out. They took it back to Babylon. The ark was gone. Paul even mentions it in Hebrews. He says, the ark of which we cannot now particularly speak because it wasn't there, it was gone. What is the ark? It's the testimony. It was gone. Now, but we can't stop there. I want you to look at Haggai. Haggai chapter 2 Verse 3, who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? My God, I mean, just, just look around. Who among you has saw this house in her first glory? I, I mean, I look around and I see, you know, empty seats here, empty seats here. And, and we all remember, you know, when we all used to go to them churches and there'd be 400 people, right? 
Every one of us. I mean, we've been to association right there, 500 people right there. Boom, we're all there, boy. And now we look and we think, man, if we could just get back to the good old days. Who among you remembers that? That's why Haggai says, who among you remembers the glory? So now we look, we look at this place and we think, and then everybody starts crying. Says, my God, I wish we could go back. I wish we could go back to the good old days, man, when we had it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? My God, that's what people used to talk about. That's all people talk about now. Remember when the good old days? Remember when the good old days? And how do you see it now? All y'all who remember them great big things, how do you see it now? Is not your eyes in comparison to it as of nothing? Y'all just a bunch of dumb people up there in a cult going up there talking about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Y'all are nothing. Four weeks from now, y'all be dried up and gone. Look at verse 7. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. My God, there, here's a prophecy. Here's a promise in saying, I'm going to fill this house with glory. Know ye not, ye are the temple of God? Christ in you, the hope, the expectation, the assurance of glory. Look at verse 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, how's all this going to come? Because he's going to shake heaven and earth. We can read that right in Hebrews, too. I'm going to shake heaven. And I'm going to shake the earth also. Nothing's going to be left but my kingdom. Then he says, and God is a consuming fire. What had happened here, guys, and after, after these prophecies and after Babylon and all this, Malachi, there was 400 years, guys, 400 years that there was nothing. There was silence. I want to flip back over to Jeremiah here just a quick second. I, I got a Jeremiah 3. I got to get this one. Jeremiah 3, 16. And it shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall they be done anymore. Do you know what he's saying right here? Let me say it this. Let me say it this way. It shall come to pass when you be multiplied in those days, in the good old days, saith the Lord, they shall no more say, I remember the good old days. That's what he's saying. Because that's what happened. The ark was gone and all them people was around saying, man, I remember the good old days, the glory days, the good old days. Everybody in here remember the good old days? Everybody wants to go back to the good old days. How about the good day you're in? The good day which is Christ. The good day which is today. We are only in the now, guys. That's it. We're only in the now. You're never going to be in the yesterday. You're never going to be in the tomorrow. You're in the now. The now which is from the beginning to the end. The now which is Christ. Verse 17. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord and all nations shall be gathered into it to the name of the Lord. We've been talking about the liberating secret of the name, right? They're going to be gathered to the name, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk anymore. Here we go, guys, in the imagination of their evil heart. Paul talked about that in Corinthians, didn't he? Casting down all, every imagination and high thing that exalts itself against God. Let me go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34. Told you I had a lot of scriptures today. Y'all bear with me. I'm almost done now. 
Ezekiel 34, 12. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them out of the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. I will bring them out from the people, gather them from the countries, and will bring them into their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture. Upon the high mountains of Israel shall they be, shall their foe be, and they shall lie in good fold, in a good fold. In a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord. I will seek that which was lost. Jesus said, I come to seek and to save that which was lost. And bring again that which was driven away. Bind up that which was broken. Strengthen that which was sick. I will destroy the fat and the strong will feed them with judgment. He says, Ezekiel right here prophesied. When the Messiah comes, he's going to seek and to save that which was lost. Guys, what we've been going over and going over and going over, what was it that was lost? The testimony. The ark of the testimony was gone. But he says when he comes, he's going to seek and save that which was lost. He's going to restore that. He says, guys, all of you remember them glory days? What do you think of this house? What did they think of this house? They said, no good thing ever come out of Nazareth. That's what they thought of this house, wasn't it? Yeah. No good thing ever come out of Nazareth. We know who he is. He's the carpenter's son. He's Mary and Joseph's son. I look at this house, and that's all I see. Little boy born in a stable, don't even know who his real daddy is. Come down here claiming it. God is his father. Let's go back to Luke. <clears throat> back in Luke. Back in Luke. Back in Luke 19. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. And then, and then right after that, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. Jesus spoke a parable to them about the pounds. Right? Now remember, he's going up to Jerusalem. His son told him that. Now look at verse 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. Ascending up to Jerusalem. I want to tell you, I don't have time to go get all these scriptures, but he says, guys, I'm going to Jerusalem, but I'm going to do it just like, just like uh, my daddy Israel prophesied back in the Old Testament. When I go up, I am, I am of Judah, the tribe of Judah. When I go up, I'm going to be riding uh, my, the ass and the colt. It's going to be uh, tied to the vine, okay? And Jesus said, I am the vine. Zechariah prophesied that he's going to come up into this city. Jesus said, guys, listen, I'm going to send up. I'm going to send up, but before I go, guys, we're going to do this right. Go down there. There's a man that, that he has a colt. And and then an ass, I want you to get them and bring them up. And when they brought them up, Jesus said on there, and when he started riding into the town, what did they start doing? Remember, we read this in Psalms. They got up and was glad in their heart because they were going to Jerusalem. Why? Because of the testimony. When Jesus began to go down through there, Patty, you know what happened? He's riding on this. People took their coats off and laid them down. And they started singing a song, Hosanna, Hosanna, the king has come, the king has come, the king has come, Hosanna. Here goes all the scribes and the Pharisees saying, man, tell these people to be quiet. He said, if these people were to be quiet, the very stones would cry out. Why? Do you think Jesus was coming to bring something back into the temple, something that had been lost because he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost, God. And if I'm going to restore it, I'm going to do it just like the prophet said, because I told you back in Luke 18, going up to Jerusalem, going to fulfill all that was written of me of the prophets. Going to fulfill it all. I'm even going to go up the right way. Mm -hmm. Going to do it all. Now look. Look what he had. Look what he had. Well... Let me just do it this way. I gotta hurry. 
John chapter 2. He gets up to the temple, guys. He gets up to the temple. What's going on in the temple? I'm in chapter 2 of John, verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those that sold auction and sheep and dove and changers of money sitting. And when he made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out. He drove them all out of the temple. Guys, remember when Solomon started to sacrifice, when the glory got put in its right spot? The smoke drove them all out. Man, they could no priest enter that place. It was full of one thing. When Jesus went back to the temple, he drove them all out. In this temple is not room for me and you and Jesus. It's only room for one, and that is him. He comes into this temple with which with we are. Everything else has got to go. Where well, all the money changers, he drives them all out. Guys, now watch this. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And the disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said, What sign showest us, seeing that thou doest these things? Because brothers and sisters, they knew. They had knew what, what Isaiah said. They knew what Ezekiel said, that he's coming up. They knew what Jeremiah said. Guys, the testimony's coming back to the temple. The glory's coming back to the temple. We're looking at this natural house. Jesus runs everybody out, and they say, show us what sign you do these things. Because they're waiting on a sign. And he said, I'm going to tell you what sign I'm going to show you. Look, look what he says. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. What kind of sign is that? What kind of, he just gave them the sign of the cross. Yeah. He said, guys, here is your sign. This is the only sign you're going to get, guys, is the sign of the cross. And the scripture says, then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in the making. And you're going to tear it and down and raise it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. He spake of the temple of his body. Guys, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Jesus spent three and a half years bringing the testimony that was lost back, filling his disciples with the testimony of God because the testimony of God had gone. We had read it. It was gone. It was out of there. He came bringing it back, restoring that testimony, filling the disciples full of that testimony. Why? Just like a good husbandman, he was preparing the ground for something better. But the testimony will bring you to something else. It's like hearing. Hearing comes first. Then we turn to see the voice that spoke. Why are you there, guys? Just go with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. To whom, I'm in verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom, and being assembled together with them. Notice what he says. Being one with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. You remember what promise, guys? Everybody wants to get saved. I mean, I'm not a... Guys, just listen to what he says. The promise of the Father. What is the promise of the Father? Right here it is in Acts. People miss that. The promise of the Father is not you find a way to planet heaven somewhere. Come on, guys. The promise of the Father is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, guys, I spent three and a half years telling you the testimony, preparing the ground, and I want you to stand still and wait on this promise. Because there's a sure promise. I've given you the testimony. But I've given it to you. Wait on the promise. For John truly baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. Now listen. Verse 8. But ye shall receive power 
After that the Holy Ghost has come unto you, ye shall be witnesses unto me. Do you see, guys, listen to this. He takes you from the testimony. What is the testimony? I mean, have you guys ever had to go give a testimony? He takes you from the testimony. When the Holy Ghost has come, you're going to be witnesses. I'm going to finish up right here. And I'll bring us back to our scriptures. In John 17, when he says this, because in all this Jesus came to his temple, and all this he returned the glory to, to the temple. He came down there. That he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. I'm all these things, guys. But here's one thing. He still had a prayer. And he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son that thy son may also glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. Not with anything else, but with thine own self which I had with thee before the world was. Guys, let me tell you something. Just as Jesus had to fulfill the natural prophecies and walk up there in a body of flesh, remember the veil, and the veil was blue, and all these other things, he walked up and he done those things and run them out. That Jesus alone was left in the temple. Same thing has taken place now. Jesus comes in to his body, which we are. And runs everything else out that only he is left. That is only him. But he tells us to wait. And, but still yet in all of this. In all of this. Jesus is still praying. Father glorify me. Did he not pray that? So guys here. Here's the question. And I'm not going to answer it this week. I'm going to give it to you next week. Maybe. What is the glory of God? Because when you begin to see this, we know everything was lost. The first thing I wanted to do was establish that he had to return that. He brought it back. But now we got to see what is it that he's praying for? What is the glory of God? And I'm going to tell you what, guys, when I start seeing this and start to understand predestination and 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 called and chosen and, and glorified and all these other things. Guys, it just absolutely blows my mind. And at the same time, remember, he said, I want you to take this ointment that was beaten. When you begin, you know what that is? I mean, Jesus was pulverized. But guys, when you begin to see this and you begin to see what role and all these other people out here in the Christian world, play. It's almost like, guys, we want to run by them and leave them there. And it ain't so. Because you know what? None of us got this revelation on our own. We were all wherever we were at, in our place. And you know, one day, boom, God gave us revelation. Boom, of himself. We, we didn't know if we even wanted it or not. And there it was, boom. And then, and then here we are. Why? Why? Do you ever think of that? Why? Why did you give that to me? Why did you leave me? I mean, two years I spent by myself. I don't know, seven years you spend by yourself. How long do you spend by yourself wondering what you're going to do, where you're going to go? Because you got a revelation you don't even know who to share it with. Why? I mean, Jesus just done all these things, but he's still praying, Father, glorify me. What is this glory, God? What is this glory? I want to know what this glory is. Give us this glory, Father. Glorify thou me with the same glory. I want to begin to understand that. Believe you me, he's going to bring us into it. And when you see it, you know what you're going to feel like? You're going to feel like that beaten ointment that is poured out on the ark, beaten to a flat pulp. Because you're going to begin to see some things. And I'm going to tell you what, it's going to remove you out of the center of everything. 
remove you out of the center, and it will be just like that lady said down there. My God, I had a child and I regarded it not. Nothing else matters but the glory of God. Nothing else matters but the glory of God. Nothing else matters. Jesus said that too, didn't he? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Nothing else matters than the glory of God. Guys, I'll turn it back over to Patty. Thank y'all.